We're in the Gospel of Luke. We want to conclude the 12th chapter of Luke's uh, Gospel this morning. Jesus has been engaged in a lot of teaching, a lot of instruction. I think it's fair to say a, a lot of warning. Uh, the clear theme of the last section, if you remember from verses 35 to 48, was readiness. He issued this earnest call to readiness on account of the certainty of his future uh, return when he comes on that certain but unknown day, those who would pre prove to be his true followers would be identified by their stewardship of duties in his absence and their ready anticipation of his return. And now beginning in verse 49 and continuing through the end of the chapter, there's a noticeable increase in intensity. I want you to notice that. And the drama of the moment. Uh, there is a sudden shift to a more challenging tone from our Lord. A crisis is at hand and it will affect them all. Jesus himself, for sure, uh, but also every person. No one will be exempt. Uh, Luke himself contributes to that atmosphere by the lack of a clear transition from the previous verses. All of a sudden he says, he quotes Jesus, I have come to cast fire upon the earth. There's no connection between that and what came uh, before. Uh, so suddenly the Lord shifts from what is expected from his followers to the monumental purpose of his own coming. He has a mission to accomplish. It is his saving work obtained at great cost and accepted by some, rejected by others. I'm using the term, if you have an outline, I'm using the term acquittal uh, to characterize that saving work primarily because if you look down at those final verses of the chapter, he speaks of an impending trial and the real possibility of punishment resulting. It is the acquittal of guilty sinners which Jesus would accomplish that forms the backdrop of every uh, paragraph that we're going to read. So while calling for a response from his listeners, the overall section is a, a sweeping commentary on his incarnation, of his coming. And so that's how it begins in verse 49. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. And they will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And he was also saying to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming. And so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say it will be a hot day, and it turns out that way. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not analyze this present time? And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? For while you are going with your opponent <clears throat> to appear before the magistrate, on your way there, make an effort to settle with him so that he may not drag you before the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I say to you, you will not get out of there until you have paid the very last cent. A very sobering conclusion to our chapter. Well, I hope you can sense the Lord uh, launches into this section with a, a passionate 
a declaration or perhaps a, a reflection, however we are to understand it, it is delivered with passion. How I wish the fire were kindled. How distressed I am until the baptism is accomplished. This fire uh, and this baptism, uh, I, I want us to understand, are two logically connected undertakings in our Lord's mind, each shedding light on the other. They're both aimed at the acquittal of a great company of sinners who are the object of the relentless love of God. So first, Jesus says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish that it were already kindled. Fire uh, in the Bible is used to represent different things and, and there have been opposing interpretations of uh, its meaning here. But the scriptures in other settings uh, reveal what he was thinking. John the Baptist uh, got his name uh, from the activity of water baptism and is called repentance. But his more important ministry was in pointing to the Christ who would come and of whom he declared that he would baptize the people with the Holy Spirit and fire. As we know, Jesus himself never baptized anyone in the traditional sense. His baptism was to be an internal baptism and it would involve fire, uh, fire first in its purifying sense through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, making sinners fit for the kingdom, uh, but fire also in the alternate sense of judgment reserved for those who would refuse to acknowledge him for who he was. In that passage in Luke uh, 3 containing the Baptist announcement, he goes on to warn of that coming one, that his winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable, unquenchable fire. Now that was reflected uh, in the Old Testament as well as later in the New, Isaiah 66, 15, uh, sounds a warning of judgment to the nations hostile to Israel. Behold, the Lord will come with fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. And in the final book of the New Testament, uh, John describes in Revelation chapter 20, how at the end of time, everyone whose name is not found written in God's book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. So when Jesus says here that he has come to cast fire upon the earth, uh, we should understand him to have in mind the fire of both purification and the judgment his coming will ultimately accomplish. And he expresses how fervently he longed for that. How I wish, he says, it were already kindled. His own righteousness cried out for the justice that would result from his coming. It cried out for the consequences of that justice, the, the penalty for sin uh, paid once for all, the freedom from sin secured, the, the victory over death, uh, won the promise of eternal life for his own, ensured the glory that would be both his and theirs in the presence of the Father. But in the same breath, he acknowledges the arduous path he would need to follow, the judgment due to the ones he came to save must be borne by him and that's the meaning of, of verse 50. He has a baptism to undergo. This would not be the only instance in which Jesus identified the coming cross of Calvary and his passion with a baptism. In Mark 10, in that verse 38, where Jesus responds to James and John's request that they sit on either side of him in his glory, he told them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? The baptism 
was the agony of the cross he faced. His suffering there, he envisions as kind of an overwhelming plunge into the deeps of the distress that he knows awaits him. This was a dread that shadowed our Lord continually. The stirring thing is that it was not the consequence of a haphazard uh, accident or some unavoidably horrible fate from which he could not escape. He had always had that option, escape. Uh, the devil himself had tempted him with it, uh, cruelly holding it up before him in an attempt to turn him from his course. But he faced it voluntarily. Uh, love propelled him. Obedience to his father fueled his determination. And that's indicated here in the anguish of his cry, how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Now, we know what it means to be distressed. It's to be dominated by a dreadful thought. I, Howard Marshall, interpreted it as Jesus saying, how I am totally governed by this until it is finally accomplished. Speaking this uh, expressively to his disciples, this would be one of the most painfully poignant descriptions of the inner struggle he endured. Though it rose to the surface more than once, there would be, for example, that scene in John chapter 12 when the, the Greeks uh, came to see Jesus and it triggered him uh, the realization that now my hour uh, has come uh, for the Son of Man to be glorified. He would say then, now my soul has become troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but it's for this hour that I came. And then Gethsemane, where uh, he prayed so fervently, you know this intimately, he prayed so fervently that the cup of God's wrath might be removed from him, that his sweat became like drops of blood. But he prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. So yes, the Lord had come to, as he puts it here, cast fire upon the earth, and he wished greatly that it was already kindled uh, but first, he knew he must undergo the baptism of the cross, uh, where his father would uh, forsake him and make him who knew no sin to be uh, sin. And all the uh, penalty for the sins of you and of me and of all those he came to save would be borne by him, and we would be acquitted. He was totally governed by that goal. So, after this opening salvo of verses 49 and 50, we find the Lord shifting his focus in verse 51 to a surprising revelation in the form of a question. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. I call it surprising because the loving and sacrificial action resulting in the acquittal of sinners described in the first two verses might lead one to imagine an inauguration of a pervasive peace among those uh, made aware of it. But now Jesus says the opposite uh, will be the case. It was a revelation that must have run counter to the disciples' A previous thinking which surely uh, held Jesus not only to be a peaceful sort of leader himself but also a purveyor of peace. Uh, the scriptures, at least many of them, uh, describe him so. Isaiah 9, 6, you may be thinking of it, uh, proclaimed him the Prince of Peace. In a short while, Jesus will gently tell his disciples in the upper room, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. 
And at the conclusion of that same upper room discourse in John 16, Jesus said, These things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Take courage, I've overcome the world. And we know, uh, looking back, for we only recently uh, were taught this in the ministry of the word in Ephesians uh, 2, 14, how uh, Paul pronounced that uh, Jesus himself is our peace. He made both the Gentiles and the Jews into one group, and he broke down the barrier of the wall that divided them. Well, all of that is true, yet in another sense, the message our Lord brought was divisive. It was divisive then, it's divisive today. It is antagonistic against the popular and secular worldviews that are meant to hold individuals up as intrinsically and morally good and that elevate all viewpoints as essentially true, as long as they seem to be true to the one holding to them. Uh, but Jesus didn't come to affirm all that. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. He laid claim to the truth. And rather than currying favor by giving reassurance to every truth claim, he promised retribution to those who would speak against the truth found in the scriptures, which was God's truth. He said he himself was God. And in, when individuals who have uh, been on the receiving end of God's grace in Christ and have received new birth and who begin to exhibit the fruit and the characteristics of that new identity in Christ and begin uh, themselves to be, become more and more like him in what they believe and how they conduct their lives and in the truths that they profess. When they put their Christ-like beliefs and behavior on display, the, the response is often acrimonious. That acrimony is especially reflected in a slight change of vocabulary. I'm, I'm leading us to another a parallel passage. You don't have to turn there, but uh, that, that acrimony is especially reflected on another occasion when Jesus was making the same point in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Jesus is quoted as saying, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring priests, but a sword. Following after Christ will inevitably generate hostility and even lethal enmity. And here Jesus warns his disciples that the lives of his followers will by no means be devoid of conflict. The decision to follow him may become a sad line of demarcation, dividing even members of one's own family. The, Lord, the way the Lord describes the possible fissures within a family in such detail, three against two and two against three, they will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, underscores the, the sad manifestations of discriminating grace that Christ's coming would bring about. It is from now on, Jesus says. Those little phrases in the Bible are so important. It's from now on. He is uh, the bone of contention, if I may respectfully borrow that figure. He is the bone of contention. It is over him that the division arises. I mentioned uh, discriminating grace. But how, how else can we describe the situation when among a group of people, all of whom are by nature uh, contaminated by sin and, and unable of themselves to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, some become his followers and some others refuse to believe. How do we explain it? And what could be a better test case for that than the family unit uh, by definition? There is so much in common among the family, common uh, bloodlines, common character traits, 
shared experiences. We've all known them, two children, three children, more perhaps, with believing parents. One goes one way, the other one runs the other. Did the parents raise them differently? Not to some degree, possibly. But the division is not to be explained by differences in child rearing, but by the discriminating grace of God. And as difficult as that is to ponder, it is that Jesus came for this very purpose to make it evident that God's salvation of sinners travels through him and his atoning work alone. The pain, though, is still real. Uh, divisions in the family are always heartbreaking, especially when they involve an unbelieving family member. But the response, here I go preaching to you, the response uh, must be one of tenacious love, uh, not a sappy softness that compromises faith in order to distract or appease, but the sacrificial love aimed at being a portrait of Christ to your loved one. Well, beginning now in uh, verse 54, the Lord turns his attention back to the crowds as distinct from his disciples alone. If you read that verse carefully, you'll see that. Uh, now the possibility of acquittal will beckon those who were something like hangers-on. We know that phrase, hangers-on. They were the typically curious onlookers. And Jesus rebukes them for their lazy posture toward life when the most wonderful thing imaginable is theirs for the taking. And he begins by wryly commenting on their knack for predicting the weather. When you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming. And so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say, it will be a hot day. And it turns out that way. Uh, weather does capture our attention, doesn't it? And ironically, these are the same two components of it that obsess us. Rain and how hot it is going to be. The, 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 the difference is we live in an entirely different natural region than that of the broad Middle East and especially uh, Palestine. Israel's rain came from the west, from the Mediterranean Sea. It still does, of course, just as it does in most countries with a western seaboard. If one were to see a cloud rising uh, from that direction, there was a good chance that rain uh, might come. You think of Elijah on Mount Carmel with his head buried uh, between his knees, uh, praying fervently for rain, and he sent his servant uh, seven different times to go look out over the Mediterranean to see if perhaps God was answering uh, his prayer. Well, that's a great picture of a faithful man uh, praying, but it also shows that uh, Elijah was just as smart as, as these crowds surrounding Jesus. He knew from which direction God would send the promised rain. A similar situation existed with the blowing of the south and southwestern winds that uh, came into Palestine from the Arabian desert. When the winds came from that direction, you knew it was going to be a hot day. Why did the Lord bring up uh, weather patterns and people's ability to predict it? You'll forgive me for saying it, but it's because talking about the weather continually is trite. But we still do it. Uh, the awkward elevator ride uh, with three people on the elevator, none of them know each other. Finally, one will break the silence. Hot enough for you? <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. I hear we might have some rain. 
there's a front coming in from the north. You see, we know where the cooler weather comes from. It comes from the north and, and where the rains often come from. They come from the north. We just call up Mike Black. We find out what the weather's like in Oklahoma. And is it headed our way? He'll tell us. And now the application is spelled out for us in verse 56. Uh, you hypocrites. You know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky. Why do you not analyze this present time? They were hypocrites because they invested valuable time on the superficial forecast of the weather, but they cared nothing for the spiritual forecast Jesus was announcing every place he went. Leon Morris wrote, they understood the winds of earth, but not the winds of God. They could discern the sky, but not the heavens. I see in this scene something like the general call of God. It's always dangerous when you step out there with an idea. <laughs> but I see it. I see uh, the general call of God. It's why I've labeled it acquittal beckons. Uh, standing in their midst is the Messiah who most of them had uh, fervently desired and looked for for centuries. He's bringing with him the embodiment of the grace and power and love of God. He's offering them release from their slavery to sin and, and the promise of membership in the family and kingdom of God. And all of that is there for the taking, of beckoning them. But no, they prefer to dwell on the weather. The clock is ticking and they, they don't even know it. The, the signs were there, but they ignored them. And were Jesus not who he is, we might think he would be incredulous. Here it is. Will you not accept it? Will you not leave your trivial concerns and embrace it? This was the same spirit, I think, that, the apostle, that was the Apostle Paul's in 2 Corinthians 6 when he urged the Corinthians not to receive the grace of God in vain. For God says, at the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. But they did not recognize it. They weren't interested in it. And the acceptable time would soon be gone. Uh, later in our gospel, in chapter 19, verse 41, Jesus is going to approach Jerusalem, and he will see the city and weep over it, saying, if you had known, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. How easy it is to put off for another time uh, decisions that seem daunting to us or that we believe will hamper somehow our freedom to do what we want. In C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters, he describes how screw, I can't, I can't assume that everybody has read the screw tape letters. I know a lot of you have, but in the screw tape letters, these are imaginary letters between screw tape, who is the devil, and Wormwood, who is a junior demon. So screw tape is continually instructing Wormwood. Well, uh, he advised his junior uh, demon, Wormwood, to use that kind of procrastination to steer his patient, which is how. Uh, what screw tape calls the humans, the demonic world, are trying to keep from falling into the hands of God. Again, known in the screw tape letters as the enemy. God is the enemy. Uh, to steer his patient away from spiritual reflection. And he gave as an example a time when uh, one of his patients, a committed atheist, had suddenly, a, a reading, uh, become troubled. Uh, with thoughts of eternity 
uh, screw tape struck instantly in response and put it into the man's head that, you know, it's just about time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> But when God then uh, whispered in his ear that, you know, there's some things more important than lunch. And then when the man persisted in that train of thought he had started on, a screw tape countered with this. Quite. In fact, much too important to tackle at the end of a morning. Much better to come back after lunch and go into it with a fresh mind. By then, uh, Lewis wrote, the patient was halfway to the door, and once he was in the street, screw tape said, the battle was won. He said, I showed him a newsboy shouting the midday paper and a number 73 bus going by, and before he reached the bottom of the steps, I had gotten into him the unalterable conviction that whatever odd ideas might come into a man's head when he was shut up alone, a healthy dose of real life was enough to show him that all that sort of thing just couldn't be true. The tyranny of the everyday, every day, your little habits, your hobbies, the numbness of the television, they keep us from the most important matters. So the Lord's call to uh, sinners is always urgent. And that's the message of the final verses of chapter 12, where the Lord directs another question uh, to the crowd in verse 57. And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? I can't I uh, promise you that I understand that question exactly right. But I th what I think he was doing, even though he was still addressing the crowd as a whole, what I think he was doing was moving from the general call aimed at the overall crowd to a challenge to each person individually, to think individually. It is on his own initiative, or rather his own responsibility, for a person to discern what is fitting to do under the circumstances. You're responsible to do that. You're responsible to do the thing that is fitting, considering the evidence that has been set before you. At the end of the day, every man and woman is responsible to make a decision for or against Christ. A parent cannot do it for you. Uh, neither can a spouse stand in your place. A, a friend's or one's children's confession of Christ will not do for you. It is your evaluation to make, your decision, your conviction, your obedience. So to, to borrow a, a slang phrase, you had better get it together you'd better get it together. You have an appointment on the horizon with God, so the situation is urgent that you prepare for it. And what that looks like, uh, the Lord goes on to describe with a short parable in verses 58 and 59, uh, putting the individual in the situation of a person on his way to his own trial. It's as if he were saying, if, for example, while you're going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate, on your way there, make an effort to settle with him so that he may not drag you before the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I say to you, you will not get out of there until you have paid the very last cent. You see, in everyday affairs, in human affairs, uh, one will seek to resolve a crisis situation wisely to avoid the consequences, the possible consequences, to avoid a penalty that might be out there waiting you. 
So settle the case, as they say, out of court. To use biblical language, be reconciled to God. You know what the verdict will be if you let it go all the way to judgment. You know. The acquittal you will desire then will not be available. Only the punishment your guilt deserves. For guilty you are, and you know it. So this is a gospel call when we read it. This is a gospel call, an urgent one. There is an acquittal to be accepted. Jesus has obtained it. And if you, and all you must do to receive it is to trust in him for it. But if you reject him, once you are cast into hell, here's the last verse. Here's the last verse. Once you are cast into hell, you will never get out until the debt is paid in full. The very last sin. That's the way the Lord left it. So we should leave it that way too. Lord, thank you for this marvelous passage that on the surface is somewhat difficult uh, to interpret, somewhat difficult uh, to navigate, and yet as we dig uh, and we come to understand it, it is marvelous, the grace of God in Christ towards sinners. Uh, what uh, a example of, of your grace and your love that you would offer uh, this acquittal to us, uh, guilty sinners uh, headed to judgment, and you give us the opportunity to take the salvation that you have provided for us, to take the acquittal and be free. May we never lose sight of the preciousness of that, and Lord, may uh, this word uh, go forth to bring conviction and to move stubborn uh, sinners who can't seem to make a decision to choose to receive the gift of life that you've given them. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.